The following podcast is sponsored by High Beam Ministry. Uh, excuse me, good master. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. Love thy neighbor as thyself. I have kept the commandments, master. All of them. Ever since I was a boy. Then you lack one thing only. Sell all that you have and give it unto the poor. Then you shall have treasures in heaven. And come, follow me. How difficult it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Welcome to the Airzats Coffee Shop. This is Jay, your truth barista, and I'm serving up a steamy cup of God's truth for the average Joe. You can catch me and this podcast on my websites, truthbarista.com, all one word, truthbarista.com, and highbeamministry.com. That's H I G H B E A M ministry.com, as in car high beam. We're shining the light of God's truth on the road ahead. Truth Barista, here we are. Once again, we're in the anointed booth. Don't you love this? Hey, I have to ask you, though, can you reupholster this booth? Because these, you know, butt marks here, I mean, we've got some indentation in these cushions, and I, I just think they're just a little bit too prominent. Oh, my gosh. Did you hear that? Oh, God. Well, you know, I find it interesting that the butt marks are more on your side than mine, so... <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> I think it's your bony behind that's doing yeah. all the damage. Well, that Just might be. saying. Just saying. But anyway, we're going to talk today about possessions, because that's what we left off last week, right? Lots of good stuff to study here in Matthew 6. So, hey, let me ask you a question. Sure. Okay, quick question for Amazing Larry. Okay. Okay, since last Friday's study... Did you have anything in your life that you were worried about? Hmm, let me think. I'm not sure. I probably was worried. I'm always worried, to be honest with you, Truth Barista, about my possessions. Because I work so hard here to make a living, and that living has to go to providing for all my life, you know, everything in my life. And sometimes I'm a worry wart, you know, about losing job, losing health, all those kinds of things. So, yeah, I probably was okay. worried. Why? You have any? you have any outstanding bills you're kind of concerned about? Uh. Uh, not Bill so much, just the fact that I can stay healthy and keep working for you, Truth Barista. That's well, my biggest it. worry. Okay, well then let me ask you about this. What about retirement? I mean, I know it's a long way off for you, Whoa. but what about retirement? Well, you know, most of us, including myself, never think about it because I just can't imagine that I'd ever have to or could retire because it takes a lot of money these days to retire. So I don't really put it in the frontal part of my brain thinking, oh, I got to worry about retirement because I got to worry about making enough money every week just to pay the bills. That's that's my big that's you know, your big focus. thing. Absolutely. I think yep. most Americans feel that way, generally. Well, in, in the suburb I live in, I, I admittedly, there are a lot of like wealthy people in various sections around me here. And it's funny how often when I talk to them, they're concerned about, oh, my my Roth IRA and and my retirement funds and with all this stuff going around in the financial world, am I possibly going to have enough money to be able to retire because mm. I've worked so hard over my life? I mean, really, worrying about retirement can be God-serving or self-serving. Correct. And I kind of wonder when I listen to them, I'm thinking, are you thinking more about what God wants to do with you now and in the future, or are you just kind of concerned about what you want to do with you now mm -hmm. and in the future? Do you, do you follow me? I do. And I think, though, our generation or the generations that have come now, they're more worried about possessions because they want to retire at age whatever it is, early, mid-60s, because they know they want want to have some time before, you know, the big the big event of going to heaven happens. So, you know, they're concerned about it. 
I don't right. think previous generations, truth barista, ever thought about that. I really don't. I think they're going to going to work until the day they die. My yeah, dad until they did. can't. Or yeah, I get I get it. Well, in my study this week on this whole section in Matthew six, and we're we're looking at this the whole topic last week and this week was possessions, mm-hmm. and I've begun to find out in this section. Here's the key: worry is an indicator. Worry is an indicator. Indicator of what? That's what we're going to explore today, sir. So open up your Bible if you would. Okay, I've got it open. Matthew 6. And just as a quick thing, I'm not going to read 19 through 24. We covered that last week. Okay. But just to kind of boil it down, basically Jesus is saying, don't value possessions so much that they become your priority Hmm. instead of the Lord being your priority. Okay. Now, today's, what we're going to explore is Matthew 6, 25 through 34, where we're not to value possessions so much that they worry us instead of helping us trust the Lord. Mm. In other words, it's worry versus trust. That's today's talk. Okay? I think their world is in a state of worry and Uh fear. Worry and fear. That's what's driving our world. Well, you know, it's it's interesting, and I shared this with a men's Bible study yesterday, actually. You know, I go to that one on Thursday mornings. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting when, in my studies, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they had everything they needed, hmm. absolutely everything. Yes. And it was a place of security. They had nothing to hide. The idea of a person being naked and not worried about it is is kind of an ancient language idiom, meaning you're exposed, you're vulnerable. And it's a shame, you know, to be naked. That's how you humiliate people. When you took them in warfare, you would strip them naked. Or it says that one of King David's enemies captured his emissaries and cut their robes off at the waist. Mm. You know, it was meant to humiliate them, etc. Okay, well, back in the garden, Adam and Eve didn't have clothing and weren't worried about it. Why? Because they had nothing to hide. Mm. It was open. It was secure. That's the big thing. They were secure. They had everything they needed. Now, after they broke faith with God and their relationship shattered, God sent them out of the garden. But just before he sent them out, he said to them, you know, you've had this great life here, but since you're not going to do it my way, I'm going to let you do it your way, since that's where your heart is set. Sure. Now, let me tell you what that means. Now, I'm going to skip what he says to Eve and go directly to Adam. Adam, he says, you're going to live life. You're going to, you're going to raise your food by the sweat of your brow. Mm. Now, a lot of people think that's I'm working hard, right? So mm. I'm sweating. Mm-hmm. Well, that's an ancient idiom from the Middle East. It actually goes back to Mesopotamia and Egypt, where the sweat of your brow means to worry. And we oh. use the same idiom today when I look at you and you go, oh, no, we're all out of the Sumatra coffee. And I'm going, hey, dude, don't what? Sweat it. There you go. Oh, That's, I love it. A, wow. Yeah. Okay. So this is the idea behind there where God's going, you are now going to live in fear because your whole secure world has collapsed. And since you're going to be doing it by your own efforts, you're going to be afraid that there's not enough food coming in. There's not enough security. There's not enough protection action because you're losing so much when you broke your relationship with me. So that is the state of humanity. We are living in fear. We're afraid of death. We're afraid we won't get enough to eat. Why? Because if we don't get enough to eat, we're going to die. If we don't get clothed or housed, well, what's going to happen? We'll be exposed to the elements and we'll die. (laughs) We're afraid that if we don't have health insurance, we're going to die. <laughs> so there's this there's this whole fear factor. Wow. <laughs> I know. Isn't that a lovely Friday message? <laughs> I'm well, depressed. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, man. So anyway, uh, what's happening is this is all the setup, what Jesus is recognizing in this section in Matthew 6. He's going, because you live in this state, this world of fear, it's driving you to grasp possessions for security. And as a result, you're making possessions your priority rather than the one who gives you security. That's your father. And in this section, he's saying, because you're grasping for for possessions and you don't get them, now you're worried about them Hmm. rather than being trusting of your heavenly father. 
That's the upshot. It is the upshot. And is that the open door to greed then? I mean, the Ten Commandments, you know, the last one says, don't covet your neighbor's this and your neighbor's that because of greed. You want something so much and your worry and your fear is driving you to covet other things because that's what greed does. It becomes your God. I I think they go hand in glove. They're not the same thing, but they do go hand in glove. The first one propels you out of a fear of insecurity. Mm -hmm. But the second one is more of, I want more than I need. Mm -hmm. In fact, I want more than I want. That's where it really starts going. Right. You know, it's like, I want this, but I want more than wants. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. hey, I want to be married. But I don't want to be married to this one anymore, so I want to be messing around with that one any, you know, some more. So this is kind of how that all comes together. So let's address this whole idea of worry versus trust, okay? Okay. And it kind of comes down to, do your possessions possess you, or do you possess your possessions? Boy, that's a good question. You know, Truth Barista, I think in some ways my possessions possess me. When you're a working man and you're working hard to make money and you buy something, there's a there's a cost factor there that you want that possession, whatever it may be, to last forever. And, and it becomes a real possession, I think. Right. And I think this whole aspect of possession, it, it possessing you is what brings you into the worry mm. side of the fear factor. That's right. Well, isn't insurance in some ways, I mean, that's a protection, but there's a worry factor with it, too. I'm worried that if I have a fire or somebody comes in and steals my stuff, well, then I'm going to be at law law. So I'm going to get insurance. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but in a way, it it is a form of worry, isn't it? Well, as I said, worry is an indicator. Now, there is wisdom, which we'll cover at the end. There's okay. wisdom in all of this, but there comes a point where it's not wisdom, it's foolishness. And worrying is foolishness. Okay. Worrying is an indicator where your heart really lies. Where, what do you trust in? Do you trust in your possessions? Do you trust in God? Because if you, don't, if you trust in your possessions and you don't have possessions, then you start to worry. But if you trust in God and you have God because he's always with us as born-again believers, then we don't need to worry. We still do at times because we're works in progress. But God, in this whole section, Jesus is saying he's, he's given us the proper perspective. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. And then he starts giving us examples and principles. So shall we go through this? Well, I think we should. But you know what I'm worried about right now? What? You what know what I'm worried about? about right now? What I am are really you worried, worried about? Well, I'm worried we don't have enough coffee in the house. Well, we certainly don't have enough coffee in our cups. So I'm worried that we should probably fill those cups up, shouldn't we? <laughs> Get the hints and come back quickly. Guten Morgen, guten Tag, guten Abend. Hi, this is Siegfried, and I know you're listening to the Truth Barista Podcast. After you are done, I want you to check out the rest of the High Beam Ministry website, highbeamministry.com. Yeah, you will find all sorts of really cool stuff besides the podcast. Things like the Frothy Thoughts blog, cousin through the Bible reading plan with comments, a growing teaching page, and other resources to vet your spiritual whistle. Yeah, it's groovy. Go to highbeamministry.com. All one word, highbeamministry.com. And be sure to hit the subscribe button and enter your email so they can let you know every week when the new stuff is posted. Do it now. Do that and you will be a most excellent person. Danke. Our culture is confused and that confusion is spilling over into everything today. God is never confused, and those who know Him and obey Him are never confused. Confusion is the absence of truth. But here on this program, we untangle our culture's confusion with the truth. Thanks for listening. Ah, no worries, mate. (laughs) (laughs) That was my perfect Australian accent. (laughs) Okay, let's get down to the text on this whole possession thing. Okay, so we're starting at Matthew 6, verse 25. Here's the premise. Jesus' starting point. This is why I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life 
more than food and the body more than clothing. So let's define the word worry. I did a word study on this. It's fantastic. Listen to this. Okay. And I know you're kind of a word nerd too, right? The word worry starts with the old English verb virgen, W-Y-R-G-A-N. It means to strangle. Hmm. That's the origin of the word worry, to strangle. It evolved into the Middle English worrying, which added the new sense to grasp by the throat with the teeth and to lacerate <laughs> or to kill. I'm ki- I'm not kidding. Kill or injure by biting and shaking. You know, like when a wolf attacks a sheep. Sure. It'll hit the sheep hard in the throat and then begin to shake it in order to tear the blood vessels and the windpipe and all to kill it, right? Wow. So in the 1500s, worry began to be used in the sense of to harass as by rough treatment or attack. So there's that assault aspect. And then in the 1600s, the word took on the sense to bother, distress, or persecute. And it finally reached the modern senses to cause to feel anxious or distressed or to feel troubled or uneasy. In other words, to worry means we allow our fear about unmet needs, strangle our thoughts, allow our insecurity to grasp us by the proverbial throat and shake us back and forth, lacerating our emotions and killing our trust in God. (laughs) What do you think of that? Guys, I'm never going to worry again. I mean, (laughs) my goodness, it's violent. So when you go back and you think about all this, what I just shared with you, seriously, what good does worrying do for us? Nothing. Have we ever seen money suddenly appear when we just sit down and worry? <laughs> worrying does absolutely nothing for us except to show us who our real master is. Okay, so moving on. Jesus says, this is why I tell you. What's the this? Well, Jesus said about how it's impossible to serve two masters in the previous study. We only have one real master. He's our father, and we are to serve him alone. And with our father as our master and not mammon or possessions as our master, we never have to worry about our needs. Therefore, see, this is the why I tell you, because we have our father who cares for us. Don't worry about your life. Yada, yada. That phrase, don't worry right there, this is a command. It's the first of three commands Jesus gives us in this section about worrying. If you look at it in the verb sense, it says this, stop worrying and refuse to be anxious regarding your basic needs. Why? He goes on to explain. Isn't life more? Isn't the body more? And the Amplified Bible says it this way, is not life greater in quality than food and the body far above and more excellent than clothing? So what's more important, life and our body, or is food and clothing more important? Jesus now raises our perspective. It's our life and who we are that's more important than meeting our need. Our needs will die when we do, but who we are will live on. So he's raising our perspective from an earthly focus to an eternal focus. So when he says earthly or heavenly, what should be our real focus and concern? Well, obviously our afterlife rather than our current life. So Jesus is saying, so why do we worry about our needs? We either don't really know about God's promise to care for us or we don't trust him. But aren't food and clothing important? I hear you say that. Oh, they're absolutely important. What I'm learning through the studies, Truth Barista, is that Jesus is always raising the bar, always raising the bar. We focus on the minors, and Jesus say, no, here's a major that you should be looking for, right? Always raising the bar. I love it. And this is raising the bar for sure about worry and fear and those kinds of things. Because he's taking our eyes off the concerns of life here and now, and he's Mm -hmm. putting it on the concerns of the afterlife. But it doesn't mean he's unconcerned about our lives now. He's just trying to put it in proper perspective. Correct. Okay. So we should be concerned about our basic needs. Concerned, not worried. So here we go. Here are his arguments on why we shouldn't worry. And it's verses 26 through 30, and we'll walk through this. And by the way, when Jesus gives these examples, he's using a rabbi's style of argument called from the lesser to the greater. If something applies for a lesser thing, it most certainly applies to the greater thing because it's more important. So here's number one argument and example, and it's about food, right? 26. 
And look at the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? See, birds are lesser, we're greater. Aren't you worth more than they? The obvious answer is yes. The Discovery Bible that gives us all sorts of interesting verb forms puts it this way. Hey, look at the birds right now. You see what they're not doing? Unlike you, they're not planting, they're not harvesting, and they're not storing, but they're doing just fine. Why? Because our Father gives them all the food they need. When was the last time you saw a bird pacing back and forth, or rocking in a chair, or twiddling his feathers from worry? What makes you think God cares more for simple birds than you who are his beloved children? Really? If that's his plan for all of his creation, what makes you think he won't feed you? Well, he probably would feed me because the bird I could eat for food, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the bird doesn't have to worry about, you know, food, but it has to be worried about bean food. I was kind of wondering what was happening to all the pigeons that were around here, why you were throwing those little scraps out the back door. And now I know. Now you know, yes. <laughs> yeah, you're sick. You are an idiot. <laughs> Okay, the first one was about food. The second one is about life. And it says this, can any of you add a single cubit to his height by worrying? Luke uses, can anybody extend one minute of life? That type of example. Well, the obvious answer is no. no. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, okay, by worrying, do you think you can stretch your life by even one nanosecond? No. In fact, worrying won't do either won't make you taller, and won't make you live longer. In fact, worrying may actually shorten your life because of stress. Okay, now here's the third argument, and this is about clothing. And notice that all three of these things are essentials. Food, life, and clothing. All baseline stuff. Here we go, verse 28. And why do you worry about clothes? Learn how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. And yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, O oh, you of little faith, or O oh, you who trust your father so little? The obvious answer to his question is yes. He will care for you because you are worth more. Again, getting back to the Discovery Bible, let's put it in these terms. Hey, look at the ground at that vegetation there. Right now, what do you see? Yep, flowers and grass. Mm. See what they're not doing? Mm -hmm. Unlike you, they're not making clothes. And yet, they're dressed beautifully. Our Father gives them all the beautiful clothing they need and even more. Have you ever seen vegetation fretting about what they'll wear that day? I mean, maybe in a Disney movie, but I've never really seen wow. any flowers shaking in their petals going, oh, how are we going to look beautiful today? And they just do because God has given it to them. And by the way, the mm. grass, have you ever seen grass going, oh, oh, how are we possibly going to survive today? <laughs> You know, no. and Jesus wow. points it and goes, the grass of the field. Back in Jesus' day, the grass of the field was burned and used as fuel to bake bread. Mm. If God is so concerned about things that are short lived, what about the eternal you? What makes us think God cares for grass more than his beloved children? Oh, you people of little faith. Mm. Okay, so. Well, the the one thing there in this passage of Scripture, which he addresses, he says, for the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, the things you're mentioning. They're worrying, they're seeking things that are they shouldn't, and your Heavenly Father knows that you have need of them. So he's really addressing faithless or godless people, right? Well, it's we're going to get to that in just a second, because okay. Jesus is setting up comparisons all the way through this. Okay. Did you notice that he's setting up the comparison between your body and life versus food and clothing? Okay. The things of the earth versus the things of eternity. In these examples, food, life, and clothing, he's setting up the little things versus the more important thing, you. And so this whole teaching he gives is this side-by-side -side comparison. And when you look at this rabbi exaggeration that he uses to make his point, how much more Will he care for you? That's that light and heavy argument from the lesser to the greater. So if God 
because of who he is, looks after such insignificant things as birds, flowers, and even short-lived grass, do you really think he'll forsake you, whom he loves and values so much? The insignificant things are at the bottom of the ladder. Right. We're at the top of God's ladder of care. Of course he'll provide for us. That's Jesus' point that he's hammering to his disciples. And that's the antidote to worry if we'll get a handle on that. So worrying won't feed us, it won't lengthen our lives, and it won't clothe us. Jesus' lesson is that our Heavenly Father has already promised to provide what we need. Therefore, we should not look down at our need, but up to our Father. Hmm. Boy, that's a good word. Don't look down on your need, but upward to our Heavenly Father. That is a good image, Truth Barista. So, I know we're kind of running out of time on our break here. So, let me just kind of ask you a few things here, too. What about the times when we have been in want? So, let's face it. I mean, you read through this and you think, I mean, the reasonable assumption, don't you think, is, well, then I should never be in need. I should never need a paycheck. I should never be in need of a job. I should never be in need of food. I should never be in need of clothing. What happens when there's not enough money in the bank? What happens when, say, in extreme circumstances, there's no food in the grocery stores? Because, I mean, sometimes there are supply chain problems. In fact, there are many, Mm -hmm. many times around the world when there are famines and when there are difficulties. Okay, so what do we do with that? I'm going to throw that to you and let you mull that over for a bit. How would you handle that? Well, I I think that if God has proven that he has provided for us, you know, in our lives, that there's a track record. And even when shortages come and famines happen, I think that is, you know, I think that is even more reason that we must trust in God. Even when the prosperity or the food isn't there, we have to trust that God is going to come through. And like Elijah and the woman at, uh, what's what was her name? She had the little cruise of oil. I mean, yeah. God can make something out of nothing. The little boy with the fish and the loaves. I mean, God makes things happen out of nothing. And he's able to do that. So I guess we have to trust in him. Okay, he can do the miraculous. That's true. But as I was wrestling with this, I get newsletters from ministries around the world that deal with people who are in famine right now. There is no food help coming. Right. And they're facing death. Seriously, they are facing death. Hmm. And so then the question comes to me, well, you know, being in the United States, Food's all over the place. Clothing's all over the place. And you can get this stuff for free if you need to. What about those who can't? Does that mean God is faithless to them? And I think of that in context. What does all of this say to the extreme? Even if nothing is there, we need to continue trusting God. Because even though the nothing here leads to our death, we can trust God beyond the threshold of death into eternity. Because this is this life is not the end all. It's eternity is where it starts. So even if there's lack here to the point where we die, that doesn't negate God's faithfulness to us. It's kind of like if God takes care of the little things, he'll take care of the big things. If grass gets cut and thrown into the fire and is burned, don't you think he'll take care of you when your end comes? That's very good. What you just said made me think that my treasure isn't in me, it's in him. And if I treasure myself, in other words, my life, I'm in for a big disappointment. And because I can die, I can starve to death, I cannot have food tomorrow. Yet in God, he's always here with me, always there for me, right? So my treasure has to be in him regardless of my circumstances here in life. And I've noticed throughout my life, and my wife and I have been through some very difficult times, say, the first 17 years of our marriage. We needed food. We needed help. Well, it's amazing. God didn't do necessarily miraculous things, but he led and guided us through the situation. He brought friends to us who gave us a nice little check at the right time when we needed to pay bills. We were on food stamps for a while. And it's funny, that was we felt comfortable with that for a while, getting the EBT card. But on the other hand, there was a point when the Lord said, so what are you trusting in, the EBT card or me? <laughs> wow. <laughs> and at that point, I said, we need to trust in you more right. than the government. So we turned in the EBT card, and guess what? He provided enough circumstances, because they were varied, to provide food for me and my wife and our four kids and f- clothing 
And we were able to even house other people mm-hmm. for periods of time during these difficult years. We all ate. We all were fine. And now, you know, this many years later, we're still alive, proving God's point. Well, he takes care of his children. And even if the most extreme things in the world come, let's say persecution, and you're denied the creature comforts and you face death, you know, even if somebody persecutes you, what are they threatening you with? Heaven? Seriously. Well, that's, you know? a, that's a good way of putting it. Yes. Death is not the, the most terrible thing that could happen, right? I mean, uh, yeah, you're, if you well, die, you're going to heaven. So what's so bad with that, right? Well, and, and think about this, too. Is not your life regarded as your possession? Do you really possess life? That's good. Is there anything you truly possess? I mean, if you really think about it, the only possessing that's done is God possessing us. And he's the one who ensures that his possessions make it into his storehouse. And that's only through Jesus. We've talked about that repeatedly. Truth Priesta, you are such a, a voice of hope today, even though it sounded like you were getting pretty depressing in the earlier comments that you were making, but you were leading up to the hopeful message that it really comes down to our trust in God. So I really appreciate it. We're going to have to pick this up next week when we further this idea of possessions and treasures and all those things. One last word. The point is all about worrying. Do you trust in your possessions or do you trust in God? And that's where we're going to hit it next time, Matthew 6, 31 through 34. Truth is getting harder to find today, but there is no shortage of it here on the Truth Parisa podcast. Spread the word. We deal with the uncompromised truth in every podcast. We are a high beam ministry production. This is Jay, your Truth Barista. Thanks for listening to the Truth Barista podcast. The best way to find out when a new podcast drops is through RSS feed. Go to our website, look for the RSS button, press it, and then enter your email. You'll be notified when a new podcast drops. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.